All right, so <clears throat> we'll start with our next presentation. Um, just so brucellosis is basic; it's a chronic granulomatous inflammation and caused by intracellular brown negative coxobacilli. And in U.S., uh, more than half the cases are either in California or Texas. However, there are other states: uh, North Carolina, Illinois, Florida, Iowa, Arizona. All these states can have incidents as well. Uh, basically, it's about uh, importation of unpasteurized dairy products from neighboring countries like Mexico and from where dairy you know, migration happens. And vast majority of the cases worldwide are attributed to uh, Brucella militense. So that's one. Looking at the CDC definition, they define it as an illness which is characterized by acute or insidious onset of fever and one or more of the following, which includes night sweats, arthralgia, headache, fatigue myalgia, weight loss, arthritis, meningitis, or focal organ involvement. You know, we can see it's just a very broad definition, any one of those. Uh, so the case can be uh, divided either into the probable or confirmed case. Probable are those where they have a com clinically compatible illness with at least one of the following. Either they are epidemiologically linked to a confirmed case or per presumed the uh, lab evidence, uh, but without definitive lab evidence. So that's just differentiating between whether they had a culture positive, if they had antibody, what was the cutoff, all those things. Whereas in case of confirmed cases, it's a clinically compatible in illness with definitive lab evidence of brucella infection. So that's a clear cut part here. Looking at the brucella species, you know, they are, uh, that's the table from New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, we can see those uh, in, those who infect human are on the top, uh, militances and abortus. Uh, the others one are there, uh, but not that common. And if you look at the animal host, it's goat, sheep, camels in case of militances. <clears throat> now, as far as human disease and transmission, it's uh, basically the consumption of infected and unpasteurized animal milk products. However, it can be due to a direct contact with the animal parts, such as placenta. Uh, you know, it's a direct inoculation, or it can be inhalation of infected aerosolized particles. Undercooked traditional delicacies, such as uh, cattle liver, uh, or airborne transmission, uh, like in case of lab accidents, where it's the lab-acquired brucellosis. Uh, this is also counted under uh, bioterrorism as well in certain situations. A brief about pathogenesis. So what happens that after entering the human body, these uh, bacteria, they're transferred to the regional lymph nodes into circulation, and they have tropism for reticular endothelial systems. That's where they go. And what happens that they inhibit the TNF alpha, and that disrupts the bactericidal activity. However, interferon gamma induced the bactericidal activity by natural killer cells. So that's how the body protective mechanism is. So it's uh, the way it works. <clears throat> so why this is unusual? Number one, it's uh, the incubation period is highly unvariable. So it's like five days to six months. Uh, but average onset of symptoms are usually at the two to four week time. Uh, the, the organism lack clearance with clear uh, any classic virulence factor like exotoxin or endotoxin. And once it goes inside the cell, it inhibits the programmed cell death. So that's one way. And then intracellular compartments where the uh, brucella exists, uh, they do the rapid acidification and that limits the antibiotic action. So that's how it leads to discrepancy between in vitro studies and how the drugs uh, in vivo. So there's a bit of difference there. Um, so on gram stain, these are the tiny gram negative coxobacilli uh, stained faintly. And isolation is often delayed as compared to the other bloodstream pathogens and um, may take up to uh, three to four days initially. And the colonies are shown here. They are uh, raised white convex colonies with shiny surface. Uh, and if once they start growing after 48 hours, they can have a diameter of like 0.5 to 1 millimeter. <clears throat> so the organism uh, can grow on the blood agar, but there's no growth on the conchi agar. They are oxidase positive and uh, urease positive. Uh, 
as far as the plates, they should be uh, taped shut and all testing should be performed in a biosafety level three practices. And um, they said that uh, American Society of Microbiology stating that identification should not be tempted with commercial or automated kits just because of danger of aerosolization at the time of doing the procedure. As far as the clinical feature goes, so you know, it's the spectrum. So uh, no clinical difference between uh, uh, different species. Primarily the common ones are militancies and abortus. There's no clear differentiation. The most of the symptoms are constitutional. Uh, fever common, which is 91%. That is based on a study of 100 patients. And uh, it can be relaxing, mild or protective. Uh, malodorous uh, perspiration is pathognomonic. And they can have uh, on physical exam, pedomegaly, spilomegaly, lymphadenopathy can happen in some percent of cases. And on labs, pancytopenia is one of those things that uh, is visible. So what organs? Primarily osteoarticular disease, and that is universally the most common complication of brucellosis. So it is just three different ways the way it presents. It can be a peripheral arthritis, a sacroiliitis, or spondylitis. Out of those, Peripheral arthritis is most common and it's non-erosive and usually involves knee, hip, ankles, and wrist. It can also involve uh, prosthetic joints. As far as the sacroiliitis, we know it's, it's readily diagnosed and usually in the context of acute brucellosis, that's where it presents. And on plain radiograph, they have this pawn sign, which is a step-like erosion of uh, anterior superior vertebral margin. When it comes to spondylitis, it is difficult to treat. Uh, it may result in residual damage, and it's the lumbar spine, which is really site of involvement. It has a subacute presentation. The other organ system is just the reproductive system in case and our focal brucellosis can result in epididymoarchitis in pregnant. Uh, it can lead to even spontaneous abortion. It can involve the liver, uh, hepatitis, they can, can be granulomas in case of both militancies and abortions. Aortic valve endocarditis can happen and that sometimes require immediate surgical valve replacement if the patient is hemodynamically uh, compromised. And then they can have a CNS involvement, meningitis, encephalitis, and brain abscesses. So pretty a wide range of clinical presentations. But specifically about the lymphadenitis, so these are the histologic features which are kind of characteristics. There's a rep a reactive follicular hyperplasia. So that's when everyone gets a bit uh, excited about whether it is a uh, monoclonal proliferation and think about cancers. Uh, however, there are lipid laden macrophages uh, with loose granuloma formulation. And in certain cases, there are areas of uh, micro abscesses. Talking a bit about uh, diagnostics, so culture of uh, uh, Absolute diagnosis uh, requires uh, isolation of the bacteria either from the blood or the tissue sample. However, the bone marrow cultures are considered to be gold standard for diagnosis, but because uh, just because it's highly concentrated in the reticular endothelial system, but it's pretty invasive, uh, not the first thing to do. And again, the variability, the cases with positive culture range from 15 to 70%, so wide range there. And subculture should be kept for at least four weeks for delayed growth in certain cases. As far as the serology, so that's where there's a lot of discussion. Uh, various ways to do it, serum agglutination, uh, cones, antibrucella, and then they are uh, ELISA-based tests looking for IgG, IgA, and IgM. It's just basically the uh, IgG, IgG against the brucella lipopolysaccharide. Uh, there's a limiting factor that these agglutination tests can have a cross-reactivity uh, of class M immunoglobulin with francitella, E. coli of 0157 and 116 strains, <coughs> Vibrio cholera, and the others are there. So there was a study done on a blood and serum specimen of 77 patients. And uh, of those, uh, Brucella species were isolated in the culture in 45% of cases. And at least uh, one of the serological tests was found positive in 80%. But if we look at the sensitivity, here's a chart that shows that ELISA IgG can be most sensitive, but it depends at what stage we are doing it. The others are also you know, pretty sensitive. So CDC basically utilizes the Brucella uh, microagglutination test, which is a modified version of serum agglutination test. 
So a uh, first serum sample when patient is acutely ill and the second serum sample is one or two to four weeks, they want, uh, they usually request two samples and a fourfold or greater rise in antibodies would mean uh, an individual is positive for brucellosis. However, it is this test not uh, that much useful in detecting chronic brucellosis cases or neurobrucellosis that is limited. Uh, a bit of comparison uh, as shown by CDC, um, you know, the cultures are usually done on the tissue, blood, uh, plasma, and that's a gold standard. Uh, PCR-based tests are basically done on the environmental samples. They can rapidly detect, uh, can isolate uh, clinical uh, various species as well, but mostly it's, it's in development. So we'll talk more about it. However, when it comes to serology, it's usually done on the sera. Uh, it's cheap and uh, assay of choice. However, it may not diagnose chronic or complicated cases, so that's a limiting factor. A graph showing how the brucellosis progress and what are the serologies look like. So initially the blood cultures will be positive, very brief window, but later on uh, they may not be. Uh, IgM will be uh, detectable uh, until subacute and later on goes down and when late and late in the course after one year, whenever there's acute exacerbation, uh, IgM will be on the lower side, however, IgA and IgG peak. As far as PCR, there are two major gene sequencing tests that are under study and being used, uh, 16S are RNA gene sequencing, and then this uh, BCSP31 uh, gene, uh, basically looking for immunogenic protein of external membrane of um, Brucella abortus. These are very promising, but uh, you know they lack standardization so far. So uh, that's where the work is in progress. However, I looked at the biofire, uh, the way they are looking at it. Um, so far, this test they do it's for uh, for it's considered as a bio threat pathogen. Uh, they uh, they have this panel which carry about uh, sixteen uh, bio threat pathogens and. Uh, it targets the brucella militensis, so it has two targets there. The other organisms are there as well, those are, but that is, uh, this test is not yet uh, for the human, path uh, human pathogen, which human samples, those are not yet validated. So as far as the treatment goes, uh, in case of adults or children greater than eight, it's a combination of oral doxycycline and a right pampin, and recommendation is a minimum of six weeks. However, there are other alternatives which is a combination of a Bectrim can be used if tetracyclines are contraindicated in case of children less than eight. Uh, <clears throat> again, tetracyclines primarily should be avoided if possible and it is replaced by Bectrim. Complicated cases, for example, endocarditis, meningitis, osteomyelitis, um, even though the case fatality rate is low, uh, there's a combination of gentamicin for initial 14 days in addition to tetracycline or vector, depending upon the situation. And rifampin can be used uh, in combination and it can help in decreasing the rate of relapse. In case of life threatening complications like meningitis, endocarditis, the, it's individual case to case decision, but the treatment can be extended up to four to six months. When it comes to pregnancy, rifampin is a backbone. Uh, is done at the 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram per day for up to six weeks. Uh, as far as the combination go, uh, Bectrim can be added, uh, but should not be used after 36 weeks of pregnancy due to known risk factors associated with trimethoprim symptoms. So now the lab exposure scenario, the patient, so there can be various situations like a person who is handling the clinical samples, uh, they can have a contact with a broken skin on mucous membrane or uh, the person may be present during the occurrence of this aerosol generating event, which can be centrifuging the sample without, without the seal carriers or splash events. And they were not having appropriate PPE at that time while this was happening or uh, handling the enriched material outside of the certified biosafety cabinet. So those are there. So what happens that uh, there, uh, there's, a, there's a protocol by CDC how to handle those, but I'm just trying to summarize here because that will go beyond the scope for a discussion. Uh, so serology is really done and they are monitored for the symptoms. They are sequence of uh, weeks they will do the serology. However, when there is a definite exposure, as I said before, uh, 
it's for the lab workers, doxycycline, 100 milligram twice daily with rifampin 600 once daily for three weeks. And alternative options uh, include a trimethoprim sulfonotoxazole in case that your patient cannot use doxy. So what happened in our patient, you know, considering this uh, necrotizing granulomatous lymphadenitis, uh, which had this reactive follicular hyperplasia, there was, I would say, detectable brucella IgG in the presence of long-standing constitutional symptoms. Uh, we, we, we prefer to treat him for six-week course of combined doxycycline and rifampin. Uh, he's, uh, he just, um, in his last week of treatment, and we are expecting him to uh, visit us in our clinic uh, next week. So basically, the learning point, uh, brucellosis is a chronic granulomatous infection from intracellular bacteria. And they can have a prolonged incubation period with potential to induce a broad range of clinical manifestations. And there are well-known challenges for in, in the diagnosis and the treatment, as we discussed, it can be a longer term and may need a post-exposure prophylaxis in certain cases. Great presentation again. Any ideas where he could possibly have contracted it? Uh, you know, <laughs> so we talked to him initially about a lot many things, uh, every sort of cattle exposure, uh, even about that uh, foot ulcer that he had like six months ago, he didn't recall um, so far. And uh, he didn't recall any other known person in his uh, uh, family that might have been a similar situation. So I'm expecting I'll dig more in detail on his next coming visit, see what he tells us about. Any thought about uh, getting another serum on uh, this patient a little bit later down the road and seeing if the antibody titer is going up. 1.0 is pretty wimpy titer. Yes, that's that's pretty true. And that's what we were thinking that, uh, you know, it didn't uh, cross the margin of alerting the CDC because I was looking at the way the, the way it goes. CDC really takes a sample if it is uh, reflex to agglutination and then it takes up. So it didn't uh, meet that margin though. So I think it would be a nice idea just to get another sample and see where we stand and it will just help the learning process in future if we encounter a similar scenario. Okay. 